Good evening, my name is Nan Chase, and I have recently been on the board of the North Carolina Room, helping to work on this project. This is the book launch party for the Hidden History of Asheville, and as you'll see, it's a terrific book, very big deal to get this done. Yay! Yay! bought little party things with the horn, so I was going to blow the horn and big deal. But anyways, this is what we are all feeling now. <laughs> As you know, Asheville is weird and wonderful, and this book is going to reveal hidden stories, hidden images that you've probably never seen before, and we'll hear more about that later. Just a reminder, cell phones off, please. And if you would like to join friends of the North Carolina Room, please do so. There are forms in the back of the room, so when you're busy buying your book, pick up a form. It's $15 a year, and that money goes to help a lot of outreach programs. And of course, if you haven't visited the North Carolina room, that's a treat. This book has about 50 stories, and I don't know how many photos, 50 to 100 photos, and it proves how important libraries are and how important people's stories are. We're going to have four people speaking tonight about stories that they have contrib contributed to hidden history of Asheville. But first I would like to introduce Jim Blanton, who is the director of Buncombe County Libraries for a few words from him. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's great to see such a full room for this program. Um, I told Zoe that I would share a story about when I first started here. I've been here about eight months, and uh, I started in libraries working, managing a local history room, and I have a real appreciation for the work Zoe and the team does here. And the, I think it was the first week I was here, they had a, a friend's a, North Carolina Room Friends of the Library meeting, and first of all, I was blown away that there was a special friends group just for the North Carolina Library. I thought that was just phenomenal, number one. And then, uh, sitting through this meeting, one of the things that they discussed was the fact that they were publishing this book, and my jaw just about hit the floor. I couldn't believe they were they had such an undertaking underway, and I can't tell you how exciting I, it is to see this come together, and how excited I am for them and the team for, for making such a, a incredible piece of work happen. And really, uh, this local history, and I know probably most of you know this, this room is a, a real jewel. It really is. There's so many wonderful things to be discovered in there. And if you have a visit, I really encourage you to do so. It's, it's really remarkable. Uh, I've seen many local history rooms in my time, and, and this is far and none one of the best I've ever seen. And, and it really is <laughs> programming in their hearts, it really, I, I just have to say it again, it's so wonderful to see a room full of folks here to see a presentation of a local history, really just a testament to the power of local history and, uh, and value of it. So thank you again everyone for coming and I, I hope you have a really wonderful evening here learning more about the history of Asheville. important to know. It's not going to any one person, it's going to this fantastic facility. And there will be time for question and answer at the end of the program. We're going to have some slides. The first speaker is going to be Zoe Ryan, a librarian at the North Carolina Room, and she had the huge job of compiling these stories, editing, and there are some of the hidden gems that authors. We're going to have Terry Taylor, Amateur History Sleuth, Betsy Murray, who is going to tell a moving tale or two, and a writer, John Elliston, and so take it away, so. If I had my little thing, I would it.
They all get, get enough recognition and they do so much work. The book would never ever have happened without each one of these people who did a tremendous amount of work getting the book out. We can tell you it's not easy to put out a book. <laughs> but we did it and we're really excited. Susan Toole was working on her library degree and in 
interning here at PAC. And for one of her class projects, she needed to create a social media for a public library, such as a blog. Well, I had never heard of a blog, but I was sure we needed one. <laughs> so I nabbed Susan, and she worked with the NC Room staff. And before long, uh, we had a blog, and we named it Herb Tell. Herb Tell is when you hear tell something from someone. Hey, did y'all hear tell about that big pig they raised down in Black Mountain? <laughs> so we got our blog started in July of 2013. The very first blog post I wrote for her tell um, was, guess what? Woo woo. <laughs> I had been reading through the, a roll of 1885 microfilm, and I gotta tell you, it was a negative roll of film, meaning it was white on black, which is very hard to read, but I was working really hard to find some announcement that they had started building Riverside Cemetery. Uh, it was originally called Asheville Cemetery. And the only information that we had for that early was a little notice in the paper in October of 1885 um, saying that the city was still trying to decide where to put it. Then, in the about town section, I happened on a notice where W.O. Wolf, that's Thomas Wolf's father, um, got the contract for erecting a new front porch on the courthouse to replace the dilapidated one. And they mentioned that the new one was to be of iron. So because it's my nature, as well as the nature of my job, to go off on tangents, I wondered if we had a photo that showed that wrought iron piece of work. And so I got up from the microfilm reader and went to our photograph database. And we only have probably three photos of the courthouse, but, um, oh, sorry, my fingers are fat. I landed on this photograph, which is incredible. It's been used in history books. It's a man carrying another man on his back on a high wire way above the crowd. <coughs> and uh, that is the correct courthouse. And if you, let's see if I can, No, I'm not going to fiddle around with it. If you look there on the second story balcony, I believe that's the wrought iron that was referred to. And we had dated this picture, uh, it was a pretty good guess, two years after the article, so we were probably right on. But now we knew something more. We knew that W.O. Wolf had, had uh, built the, the porch, and I knew right away that the Wolfies would love that little bit of information. <laughs> <clears throat> So I'm staring at the photo, going, wow, how cool is this? And the phone rings. It's a zippy young man on the other end of the line. He said he had found a really cool image in our database, and he wanted to know how to go about getting it. So I gave him the spiel for five bucks. We'd send him a high-resolution sc high scan. Um, I asked him if he had the ID number for that photograph, and I clicked out of the image I was looking at so I could go to the search screen to put in the number of his photograph. Photo ID number B093-8. <laughs> I just about fell off my chair. <clears throat> it turns out that this patron was just about to open a new brewery in town. They were calling it <laughs> and he wanted to put the photo up in his, in his business. <laughs> See, when you all have trouble if uh, this happened to you? <laughs> so that's what the blog started out with. It, that was what I consider a big bang woo-woo. <clears throat> And then about three years ago, um, I thought the next best step to take was to 
gather the best of the stories we've been telling for so many years and see if we can get them published. Um, lots of hills and valleys later, here we are tonight. I want to just read you a paragraph out of one of my favorite stories. This, this is in the book, and it's about the flower ladies of Asheville. Um, and this specific publication, uh, published in 74, was actually in our, in our book collection, and I just happened to buy it one day. And I went, oh, I was so thrilled to see this woman's face because I remembered seeing her selling flowers in the vestibule of J.C. Penney's, excuse me, when it was on Battery Park. Anybody remember the, that bit yeah. there? <laughs> Julie Lewinsky, what did you used to buy there? This picture is Emily Racy Tabor Jones, uh, probably the most well-known and, and written about flower lady of Asheville, and perhaps the last. She was born in Asheville in 1893 to Larkin and Fanny Tabor. She married Manly Eugene Jones in 1921 at the age of 28. She and her husband used to sell wood and kindling until gas and electric stoves came along. Her husband died in 1964. Jones did not attend school, nor could she read or write. She began her trade on the Saturday before Mother's Day, 1925. Working on the assumption that everybody likes flowers, she made it on her own, selling flowers for almost 60 years on Charlotte Street in front of the former Ingalls grocery store. That was back when Mission Hospital stood on the corner of Charlotte and Woodfin Streets. Uh, so she sold from the sidewalk behind the hospital. Bob Terrell wrote about Emily in 1970. Uh, he, she told him that she sold flowers seven days a week, but not until after two on Sunday. She told him, people come from fur and nigh to buy from me. They come from Canton, Old Fort, Burnsville, all around. Gladiolas were her favorite flower. Um, so Emily died in 1985 at the age of 92. After reading her obituary in the newspaper, uh, a woman resident of Asheville wrote a little editorial to the paper and she said, it would be wonderful to see this part of the city more full of life and to have more monuments of people and places we would all like to remember. One such monument should be for Emily Jones. The monument could be located in a flower bed like the one in City County Plaza. I'm sure she would appreciate being remembered by her hometown, and it would bring alive some of Asheville's history. Um, I need a secretary. <laughs> After we posted that blog, uh, uh, original board member Michael Reed uh, who shopped around, knows our collection real well, and is looking for materials we don't have. He remembered them that he had bought these several years ago. And these are absolutely priceless photographs. They've gotten a little blurry when I blew them up. But this is taken in 1930, so we're in the midst of the Depression. And they're stand the women are standing on the corner of College up front and Lexington. You can just see the side corner of the Crest Building. Uh, showing up there and, uh, and as you'll read in the book it was really really hard work to sell flowers women had to stay up late at night or get up very early to pick and gather flowers or pick them from their garden 
or get them off trucks later so that they would be fresh enough that people would want to buy them. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight and for helping us celebrate the publication of our first book. It really means a lot. And next, I want to introduce the second reader. Uh, he's an artist of many genres and also a board member of the Friends. Um, Terry Taylor. <laughs> Terry Taylor, AHS. Watch it, watch the wire. I'm good. It's okay. Does everyone recognize this, where this picture was taken? Beaver Lake, that's right. Um, you'll note that the date is December of 1958. Uh, according to my um, Ed, Ed Sheary, what year is that, that, that truck up there? My personal car expert says it's between 1947 and 1950. That's all we know. But it's a Chevrolet. If you recognize the woman pointing to the sign, please find me and let me know. Because I would love to know who she is. There's snow on the ground. She's wearing open-toed pumps. It's just that's a great picture. This is the kind of ephemera that I, in the morning, with my tea, I sit at my computer, and I go on eBay, and I look for these things. And it's these little pictures of like, who knows, no one else maybe doesn't, people who live in Asheville know what this picture is, but nobody else does. And those are the things that I like to, to buy from the North Carolina room, and then I do a little research work. Now, while I'm looking in the morning, one morning, I found this. Now, you might think, it's a picture of a pig, for Pete's sake, Terry. But no. If you can't read what it says at the bottom, it says, Big Boy, the world's largest hog. Official weight, 1,904 pounds. January 5th, 1939. Owned by Lyle and Sanders, Black Mountain, North Carolina. Wow. Did I bid on this card? You better believe it. <laughs> now, here you go. Close your eyes and imagine that you're in Asheville 80 years ago. Now, picture a shiny red truck rolling into town, towing a yellow trimmed red trailer home equipped with air conditioning, two sound systems, and electric lights standing on the corner of Ashland and Patton Avenue, where at that time, 1939, was the Asheville bus station. Look at that, four feet, two inches high, nine feet long. How more do you want? Big boy. Now, the trailer was Big Boy's home, away from home. In 1939, a Fox movie tone uh, newsreel cameraman captured Big Boy in all his glory of kingdom uh, at, at Black Mountain School. Girls in shorts chasing around the field. I'm not going to tell you anymore. If you didn't read it online, go buy the book. <laughs> Now I want to give a shout out to, oh, the rest of it is, after this blog post was posted, we uh, drew Resinger at the, uh, uh, what is it? Register of Deeds. One of his workers found the original bill of sale. <laughs> Got the truck to go with it. <laughs> now, Thomas Calder, hey Thomas, I'm gonna give you a shout out. 
Thomas, is, Thomas writes for the Mountain Express, and he's a big fan of the North Carolina Pledge. He wrote an article a couple of weeks ago about the Tyler Building, which is on the corner of Walnut and Lexington. And he happened to throw away a little line about there aren't very many pictures of that uh, building. Well, I promptly emailed Thomas and said, oh, yes, there is. Do you know where that is? And if you walked down Rankin Avenue, you, you would know that that is the top floor of the Tyler Building. But nobody, and I certainly didn't know when I bought this, that it was a bowling center in 1941. And there were three bowling alleys in Asheville then. There was that one, there was one on Haywood Street, and there was the brand new one down in Biltmore. Now I'm going to give this to, to Betsy. Betsy's going to tell you a story. working at, in libraries in the early 1980s here at PAC in the children's room. Went from here to UNCA library for many years and then came back to finish my library life at the North Carolina room. And it was a, a grand finale. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, the woo-woo moments were endlessly interesting. And for me, they took the form of the, the collection spoke to me. I would, I would uh, look at the pictures and I would just hear the voices of the people. This is um, in the center and the, the big hat is Gallatin Roberts, who was mayor of Asheville at the time that the banks failed. And it, it was devastating though. The city was bankrupt, didn't pay it off until the 1960s. Many Asheville people lost their life savings. It was um, and it was especially devastating for Roberts. He, he was um, indicted along with other city officials and bank officers. And um, it was, he couldn't face the shame of, of a trial. And he uh, committed suicide. For, and his wife was, of course, devastated. She put all his papers, scrapbooks, photographs into a box, into a trunk locked it, didn't want to ever talk about it. And her daughter felt the same way. She, <coughs> Gallatin's daughter was only nine when he died. And she also kept the trunk locked until her death. Finally, it was about 50 years later, the granddaughter brought those materials to the library after her mother died. And finally, the, job, the chest was opened and we had this amazing collection of materials. The scrapbooks are a record of that time period um, when, well, it was, quote, frenzy finance, and the Asheville was growing, growing, growing. They couldn't um, see the, the boom ever ending. And here you see a man, um, I think you can tell a lot from a picture, even at that distance. Can you see his face? He's a He's a proud man, he's an upright man, and um, he's a righteous man. Maybe a little uptight man. He, and I mean, once we had his papers and started reading, he, he uh, had written shortly before this picture an uh, extensive autobiography. He wrote in great detail about all the events in his life and how at different crossroads, fate would direct him in a certain way. And he um, was very open also about his feelings, his, the, the, his thoughts. And as I was transcribing this autobiography, I really felt like I knew him. One thing I learned working here pretty quickly was that people want their stories told. They really want everyone to know who they are, what they did. And he was. He especially had written this um, really, really detailed account of his life because he wanted people to know. And then 50 years later, the chest was opened and 
the genie came out of the bottle and we learned read many things about him. Um, that's, if I can it. This is a rough draft of the autobiography and then um, it, it was all, all handwritten, very, very personal, very, we, you could just um, feel his voice. Here he is as a young man. He, he was very, they were very poor. His father abandoned the family when he was just a child. His mother struggled to raise her two sons. They were dirt poor. Started, the boys started working as soon as they could. And with help of family, he uh, was able to go to college in Mars Hill. And he scraped together every penny he had earned to buy that suit. And I can only scratch the surface of this story here, but if you want a, a really fun story, read the book. It's uh, The Stolen Suit and the Fickle Finger of Fate. <laughs> it was another, it was one of those points where um, fate pushed him in a certain direction. This is what Asheville looked like when Roberts bought his suit. It's, um, he bought it at the old racket store on Biltmore Avenue and he named the person that helped him at the store and he had a good memory. His, um, we could verify in the city directory that that man did indeed work there. There's as many horses on the street as vehicles that you see with the trolley. Well, fate again stepped in. Roberts uh, became a lawyer, he had a term in the state legislature, and a successful term as mayor of Asheville. But as he was looking forward to retirement and writing his autobiography, you know, he was telling the story of his life, his supporters convinced him, persuaded him against his better judgment that he should run again for mayor. They said, we, we need someone of your sterling character, someone that people will trust. And that was what ended up being his, um, his fate. Um, I, would, I want to tell you one more story about how a photograph spoke, <coughs> this time so intent, so insistently that a patron heard and we'll put together the pieces of the puzzle. This, uh, this is a story about a woman named Tempe Avery. Um, she was a slave. She um, was purchased by this man, Nicholas Woodfin, around 1940. 1840. <laughs> 1840, he bought this young girl, and she grew up in his household, um, became a skilled nurse and midwife, and was very close to the daughters of Woodfin. Um, his daughter Eliza wrote a really moving story about her, describing her, her the clothes she wore, the and her her manner, her, the way she made you made you feel, and how what a skilled and loving nurse she was. So we knew a lot about her. Though when Nick, when Woodfin died, he left property in um, in Montford. And you, just, you see where Pearson crossed his chest, and that triangle is, yeah, I'm going to use a pointer, <laughs> if you really have to. <laughs> um, that's Stumptown, the black community in Montford, very conveniently located. The former slaves lived there and then walked to their employment at the homes of rich people in Montford. This uh, map, 1891, you see how few houses there are. And um, then, here's a, um, this is a Sanford insurance map. Sanford insurance map, so interesting. They, um, uh, here we go. Now, pointer, here's her house. And the, the map, these Sanford maps show the shape of every building and all the facilities in the building and so on. The corner of um, Pearson there where her, her property was that, that Woodfin left to her, 
That is now the site of the Montford Community Center. And uh, recent, recently, um, City Council voted to rename the center the Tempe Avery Montford Center in her honor. So we knew a great deal about this woman. Her obituary was in the newspaper. You know, we knew that she was a respected member of both the black and the white community, delivered many babies. But we, as far as we knew, did not have a photograph of her. We didn't know what she looked like. But we did have this photograph. And um, it was donated by um, a patron told us what she knew about it. She said the baby was her mother. Her mother uh, was Pauline Moore, whose father owned the Ritzy Men's Store where George Vanderbilt did his shopping there. Um, and they employed a nurse for their baby. The, and the donor said her mother remembered her nurse very fondly as Mammy Turby. Well, I put this picture in an exhibit with the information that we had. And a patron who had done a great deal of research on the Woodfin family and knew, knew about Tempe, knew a lot about her, read that caption and thought, Tem Tempe Turpy, you know, maybe this was how the child remembered it, how, or maybe a mispronunciation. Could this be, the, could this be Tempe Avery? Well, luckily, we had a way of, of checking that out. A, a descendant of Tempe Avery had visited the collection to research her ancestor, and we had contact information. So we, we contacted this woman, um, sent her a, a digital image of the picture. Could this possibly be your ancestor? She responded, I have that same picture. <laughs> So now we had a face to go with all the other information we had. And then, in a, well, sort of the icing on the cake, we put Tempe's descendant in touch with the woman who had loaned us the photograph. After more than 100 years, it was incredible to think of a descendant of a former slave talking with a descendant of a wealthy family whose children were loved and cared for by that same woman. They had a long conversation that was meaningful to both of them. So wherever, wherever she is now, I think she's smiling. <laughs> and now John Elston is going to share the story of another local woman who really needs to be remembered. Uh, as a brief aside, I first stepped foot in this room about 40 years ago to this day to mangle Mozart on the piano and win the piano competition in an itchy wool suit. And I can promise you that today's uh, proceedings are much better attended and much more entertaining. <laughs> And in the spirit of that, I want, I want to say a word about the North Carolina room to orient you. It's just around this corner, open every day but Monday, and it's a fun place to research. We say it's where research is a delight, and there's not too many libraries you would say that about, or perhaps not as many as there should be, but it holds true. And part of what makes it delightful is the things that you find there, and you'll see ample proof of that in the book. The other thing that makes it delightful is the things that you bring there, uh, the collections you share, uh, the, the knowledge you share, the family histories, the business histories, the cultural histories. And uh, I wanted to share an example of, of something that we, we happened upon that's sort of in that vein. Um, I want to introduce you to Western North Carolina's Wing Walker, Yuva Shipman Minners. I would hazard that very few of you have heard of her, and in a minute we'll find out why. Um, her story was first discovered by a former North Carolina Room staffer, Lon Kedick, who initially wrote up for the blog. 
And um, then for our hidden history book, uh, I supplemented Lyme's initial work on it, and we're only now starting to flesh out the full story of Yuva. Uh, but here's what we've learned thus far. I would pity anyone who tried to keep up with Yuba. She carved a blazing path through 1930s America as an aviatrix. That's what they call female pilots of the day. Particularly those who are also pioneering stunt pilots, parachutists, wing walkers, and race car drivers. As Yuba was. She was born Yuba Shipman in Hendersonville in 1908. She was the daughter of a reverend. She was raised in Asheville before setting her sights on points northward and up in the air. In her early 20s, Yuva danced professionally. Um, she wed in a self-described marriage of convenience to move to New York City so she'd have some cover for life up in the Big Apple. This was her partner in crime, her dance partner. Um, they danced and split amicably before um, Yuva went on to do uh, many great things. Uh, I'm grateful to Yuva's daughter, Carol Ann Williams of Hendersonville, who shared all these images with us, including this one of Yuva in New York City. Yuva's daughter, Carol, told me, Mom always did crazy things. I think it was foolishness myself. Yuva's daughter was quite surprised when I tracked her down. For reasons we'll discover in a minute, her story is not well known, considering that she had a moment in the national spotlight, the better part of a decade. Her daughter says she hardly ever gets asked about it, but she's been very diligent in keeping her mom's old scrapbooks. She was kind enough to share those with us. That's how we're seeing these images today. At any rate, whether Yuba was foolish or not, from in and around New York City, she rose to fame as a dashing daredevil she dazzled crowds at races and air shows, gracing breathless newspaper accounts that spread around the country and back home to Western North Carolina, where folks in Asheville kept up with her with delight. In one of those articles in 1935, Yuva said this. She said, young women today have to be adventurous about the jobs they pick. They have to be because all of the safe and sane places are taken. <laughs> And one certainly doesn't want to be a loafer all of one's life. <laughs> she liked to sign her uh, parachute pictures good to the last drop. <laughs> you were eventually tired of walking on wings and flying airplanes and jumping out of them, and so she turned to race car driving. Uh, and she crashed many of them with a plum, it should be noted. Um, she became so famous that a certain sector of corporate America came calling the cigarette industry. And for a time, she was the official spokeswoman of the Camel Cigarette Company. With startling photos like this in national magazines, along with a cartoonized version of her life, as a um, chain-smoking parachutist. <laughs> Camels don't jangle my nerves, she reportedly said, and they encourage good digestion in a pleasant way. <laughs> uh, Yuba's daughter told me differently. She said, Yuba wasn't really that much of a smoker. It was just a bunch of hooey. Carol said that Yuba was just always different from everybody else. She said that her mother, while a star in her early years, spent most of her latter decades beset by mental illness and was occasionally institutionalized. She retired from her high-flying adventures in about 1940. Then she worked for a bit for the Defense Department as a clerk. She lived around the country before settling back in Hendersonville. She died there in 97 in relatively obscurity, in relative obscurity at age 88. You can go see her now in Oakdale Cemetery in Hendersonville. It's a little hard to see, but her headstone has an etching above the biplane. 
and the Bible verse and the word grounded at the bottom. <laughs> so this in a nutshell is the life of Yuva Shipman Minners, one of the great but largely forgotten aviatrixes. She was someone who for a decade or so embodied the idea that women could be great daredevils, that this was no longer exclusively the realm of brazen men. And she wasn't shy about saying as much. We're lucky to have found her story through her daughter and her scrapbooks, which tell us so much. They don't tell us everything, and they give hints that there's a lot more to the story about Yuba. If you'll compare the two photos, you might notice um, a bit of photographic sleight of hand taking place. Um, granted, she was a real wing walker, but we found this photo was staged. You're probably not sur surprised to find that she had at least six suitors uh, in this photograph. Um, so stories like these that delight us, and we find out about them from you and from the research of our fantastic librarians and volunteers, and this book is chock full of them. I know many of us fancy ourselves actual history buffs, but I promise you, when you buy this boat tonight, or soon, <laughs> you will find stories you don't know. Uh, we're selling them at the low price of $20. It's a bit of a discount. Um, five copies for $100, today only. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in, in the event you're short on uh, money today, come see us in the North Carolina room, and we'll be happy to sell you some copies for your holiday uh, shopping in the coming months. Um, that said, I want to make sure we use the remaining time to hear your questions and thoughts. And I want to invite our authors to come sit up here. They're very humble, but I'm going to ask that they come sit up here. And I'll field your questions and translate them, and, and uh, we'll have a bit more discussion. Thank you. Yes. The question is about the late Mayor Roberts and that autobiography, and to what end was he writing it? He wrote it. Um Shortly before he ran for mayor the second time, he would he was like getting toward retirement age. He, um, he was old, he was in his fifties, but I guess at that time it felt older. <laughs> but um, but he wrote it so that we would so that we would know. Um, he wanted his life story to be known, and so it ends before he becomes mayor in 1927. The, the, way, the reason we know about what happened next from other documents, his, um, his suicide note, you do not want to hear that. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he was very, he poured his heart out and, um, and we have all that document. Yes, Susan? Uh, can you tell us briefly about the cover photo? Yes, the question is, what can you tell us about the cover photo? I'm going to let Zoe field that. Um, that was in a 19, I think that's 1904 picture, a scrapbook that um, y'all know Chan Gordon, the proprietor of Captain's Bookshelf. He was away somewhere book buying and a friend of his who sold materials showed the scrapbook to him because it was a bashful. And Chad had no intention of buying it, but as he was flipping through the pages, he saw and identified the only person in the world that could have a photograph of his house. Uh, and, and nobody else would have identified it because it was before um, later editions. It's on Montford Avenue. I can't remember the cross section. It's on Cumberland and Cullowee. Cumberland and Cullowee, right. So this picture was in there um, of two men and their three horses fording the river, the French Broad River, going across to the Riverside Park, where that this weekend we actually found the documentation of a horse races that were being held to her. And the only real history of Buncombe County written by F.A. Sonley tells the exact description of the wires that went across the whole river to both sides of the banks and the pulley systems and how the men would work with the pole to keep the boat 
um, against the stream of the water to make it move. Yes, here. Yeah, but yeah. sure, thanks. Um, it, it sounded like you were having to put bits and pieces together to tell these stories. Do we now have an organized way to record the history so that 50 years from now people won't have to be putting together bits and pieces? Is there an organized way to collect and manage history from now on? It's a great question. Uh, obviously, we're piecing together a lot of local history with stories like this, but the question was, is, is there a system? Is there an organized scheme for collecting these histories? And again, so I think you can tackle that. I'll take help, Catherine, if you've got any thoughts. I would say one thing is our database. Uh, we have thousands and thousands of photographs and postcards, and they're all scanned, and you can look at them. And we have on their records everything we know about that photograph. So that's a, a great place to start. We also have our special collections. Um, at least described online. UNCA Special Collections have, has also some wonderful pieces of local history. A lot of it is spread all over. There's so much. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the neat thing about this book, I think, is that um, it's so cool to think about the people who have lived here in this place before us. A lot of times when I'm walking down Haywood Road or something, I'll think about the people who lived here before and used to walk on this road or past these buildings. And um, I also think one of the strong points that comes out of the book is that people make a difference in the city they live. And I think, especially in Asheville, um, it's a great place to make a difference, to do what you want in your life and what you feel needs to be done. And so it was real fun to find people who were living their life, and we found them, and we kind of brought them back. And there's a great feeling of being able to do that. Talk about Mystery Harvest. Talk about what? <laughs> Mystery Harvest. We're talking about getting things organized. Like, is there an organized way of getting I mean, like, if something happens today, in 50 years from now, is there a system to keep today's history for those in the future? We, we try to be the threshold to the contemporary city as well. We're, we're constantly indexing local stories in Nashville newspaper and Mountain Express. Uh, there's a lot out there. One way you can help us is we don't get out a lot much, but we love to collect brochures and flyers and things happen, happening around town. Bring them to us because we can't get them all. Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to add to this. Hi, I'm Catherine. Um, so one thing, too, just like gathering contemporary history is one of the things we do in the North Carolina room is we have an ongoing series of community-based archiving projects. So that is an oral history project that is community driven. So um, we go out into, we've started this in the branch libraries, and we try to find folks like you who are interested in interviewing their community members. And then we bring that back into our archives and we preserve it forever, uh, hopefully. <laughs> you know? But, but it, it, by all means, it would be here forever. Um, and as a part of that, we have what are called history harvests or scanning days. And we let the community know that we're going to set up shop somewhere near them with all of our scanners and all of our equipment, and we say, drag all that stuff out of your attic and come see us. We're gonna be here one day only, right? And we're gonna scan all of your stuff for you at a super high resolution. We're gonna put that on a flash drive and we're gonna give it back to you. But as a part of that, it's going to come onto the North Carolina Rooms database <coughs> and be preserved for the community for a month. Right? <laughs> I just wanted to add that one thing people can do is write on the back of a picture the names and the dates. That would help a lot. Good point. Yes. I'm curious as to what the editing process was like. In other words, was it a tough call as to what they did and what didn't? What was 
left on a cutting room floor? Because I'm thinking there's probably a lot of stories. And what was that process like? It's a question about the editing process for the book. And it's a good question. How much did we leave on the cutting room floor? I'll field it real quick, like, if that's OK. We did have a wealth of stories to choose from. Uh, we were fortunate in that one of our, one or two of our board members have already published books via the History Press, the publisher we went with, and they're extremely helpful at that publishing house, and they have very specific criteria for the formats they're looking for, and this, the ways you might organize a book like this. So we had a committee of several of us that met together over time and tried to, uh, more than anything, I think, show the sheer variety of the stories over the span of time, over the uh, span of the community, and uh, we really, if nothing else, succeeded in that regard because it's a true grab bag. There's a little bit of something in there for everyone. And there were probably some painful omissions that will have to be in volume two. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, absolutely. The, the book is um, rich with stories from all sorts of groups in Asheville, including the African American community. But I'll let Zoe speak to this in particular, perhaps the new project, if you want to take note. Yeah, we, uh, we have a chapter that Betsy wrote on E.W. Pearson, and we also have another chapter that she wrote on Leroy Baxter, uh, a kind of folk artist painter, as well as the article on Tempe. Um, there's several art chapters on immigrants that uh, came to Asheville as well, especially Jewish and Greek immigrants. Um, we, the community projects Catherine mentioned, we started because a lot of our collection was central to downtown, not as much had been collected in outlying counties, in county communities in the county. And also our collection was um, typically white, middle, and upper class. And the best way to diversify a collection is to go out into the community and seek what you're missing in your collection. We started with North Asheville last year. We did the Fairview community, a much more rural community. And also last year, continuing all of this year, we're doing the Black Asheville History Project. Um, and we've been interviewing Stevens Lee High School alumni and um, pretty much anybody we can get to talk to us. Um, and we're uh, in sore need for photographs from the black communities. Um, as I'm sure you all know, black community had some real troubles here through urban renewal. Whole communities were devastated and our high school was raised and there's a lot of mistrust with county and city governments and so we're working really hard to build a trust and to let them know that um, our job is to collect all of Buckham County uh, not just the white folks and we care very much to have their stories so that they can pass them on to their grandchildren Sorry, that was so long. It's one of my no, it's, passions. That's a good one. Great question. Great answer. Let's take a couple more, and then we'll let y'all get on your way. Are there any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to share a little move. Today was the first time I ever came into the uh, North Carolina room. I haven't felt worthy. I collect a lot. But anyway, so today was the first day I came in. And you have a picture there on the, on the table of uh, Wilma Dykeman on the river, they were what I'm talking about, yes. and you're trying to identify people. And I just happened to look down, and there was a little post-it note with my wife's name on it. <laughs> <laughs> the arrow to the picture. So I needed a magnifying glass, and all of a sudden it was Lori Peterson of Madison County, not my wife, but it was just kind of a... <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we got that straight. 
right, anyone else before we go? I think not. Thank you so much for showing up. <laughs>